Hello and welcome to UXOS. My name is Carl, and today we are looking at experimentation and optimization. Cool, so experimentation. So what do we mean by optimization? What do we mean about experimentation? So this is a, uh, a really handy process, a really uh, handy tool to add to your tool belt as a UX designer to be able to make incremental changes to a design so that you know you're making uh, impacts in the right way and not just making random changes through a structured way to improve the metrics of a product. So I'll quickly just go through the process. So. Every time we look at optimization or we look at experimentation, we always understand data. You always have to start with the data. So I'm going to walk through a process as to how you do this, but we'll quickly walk through. From that data, we're going to create a hypothesis. We're going to test that hypothesis. Then we're going to analyze the results of that test. If we see positive results, we'll look to move into implement. We'll add it into the site and you would have had a scientifically back change to your product which is making positive impact on your metrics. If on the other hand we're analyzing the results and it's not a positive impact we look to iterate and we look to learn new things and then we create a new hypothesis out the back of that failing test. There's no such thing as a, a losing test. A test can, uh, can, can win, it can lose but you always learn something so there's no such thing as a wasted test. You're always going to learn something new out the back of your experiment. So we're understanding the data. So we start with the data. So I'm gonna run through an example here that I've just made up um, just for the sake of this uh, tutorial. So as an example, let's say we work at Etsy. Etsy, if you don't know, is um, uh, an online, online market where um, people, independent people can sell things that they've created, for example. So if you wanted to get a mug with, um, with your friend's face on it, for example, you could come to Etsy, you could uh, search for a custom printed mug and you'd get a load of results from uh, independent sellers who are selling that product. Um, and let's say, uh, again, just an example, I've made this up, that users are 60% more likely to add an item to their basket if they apply two or more filters on the search results page. So as I say, I've come here, I've searched for a uh, custom printed mug and this is the search results page, the SRP. And from here, a user could uh, click on this filter and they can apply some filters to, uh, to their search results page. So they get a more tailored results. They're getting the items they want to see. So from this, we have an interesting data point. That's a really interesting data point to build a hypothesis out of. Uh, but we'd want to maybe dig a little bit deeper into that. So you'd maybe want to explore a little bit about what filters are being applied. Maybe the most popular filters that users are applying when they come to the search results page. Maybe we see price, color, the location of the shop, and special offers, as an example, um, are the most prominent filters. So now we want, to, we want to take this really interesting data point and we turn it into a hypothesis. So a hypothesis is a, uh, is a, a structured statement based off the back of that data point that we've just found. So it takes on a, a fairly standard format, which goes in, in this format here, we see at the top. We believe that if we do X, Y will happen. And we will know this to be true if we see an increase in Z metric, for example. So from our data point, the hypothesis that we would create is we believe that if we make it easier to apply filters, users will be more likely to find an item that appeals to them. We will know this to be true if we see an increase in filter usage and the success rate of adding an item to their basket. So it, it makes sense, it's, it's quite common sense that we know that six, users are 60% more likely to add an item to their basket if they're applying filters. We're, 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 we're putting that into a, a structured format. We're saying if we make it easier to apply filters, we're, we're more likely to see people adding items to their basket because we have this data point that informs that hypothesis. So now we have a well-structured hypothesis backed by data. So what do we do with this? We need to, from our hypothesis, create our hypothesis, we need to now test our hypothesis. And the way we do that is we will create variations in our design. So first of all, we'll look at our baseline. Baseline just means what there is now, what, what exists now, what users are interacting with. And this is what a user will see if they come to um, Etsy right now. This is the mobile experience I'm showing you here. The user searches for custom printed mugs. They see uh, a filters button here. Uh, they click on that and they will see this uh, long list of filters. And just as an example, I'm going to show you, I've screenshotted all the filters that are available to a user coming here. There's a lot in there, um, quite a lot of information to absorb. Maybe it's quite hard to find the information you're looking for in particular. Um, 
So the first thing I, I did was I created um, a variant A, um, which just means you know, the, the, something that we could test. So the variant A here, the A variant, is um, what I've done is I've just cleaned up some of the UI and I've applied labels to our buttons. This is really good practice, it's very accessible. Um, maybe users aren't understanding that this is filters. Uh, adding the word filters next to it um, could make that you know, way, more, may, way more easier for a user to understand. Um, maybe just even increasing the size. We've got the label, it's made the button bigger. Maybe a user's more likely to see that, more likely to see the filters, more likely to apply filters. Um, but the uh, variant B is one I'm, I'm more interested in here actually. So what I've done is I've, I've lifted out the, um, the most popular filters and we've put it into this kind of uh, pill pattern here that a user can scroll across. So um, I'll show you an example of what this looks like in a second, but what we could do um, this, we could either decide to run um, an AB, so we could run uh, the baseline versus variant B, or the baseline versus variant A, or we could run um, an ABC, so we could run a very, you know, a baseline and then you know, BC, so um, it's up to us what we want to do. Uh, another popular methods include um, MVT or uh, multivariate testing, which is when you're making a large group of changes, you want to see what changes in what order um, and in what combination are making certain impacts. But for the sake of this, we'll just um, look at AB. So um, let's say we want to look at this variant B and we want to run our baseline against this variant here. Uh, I've created a little prototype just to show you what that might look like. So a user comes to uh, the search results page, they've searched for uh, the custom mug, uh, they can scroll through here and a user could scroll across, they could see these filters which we know backed in data are very popular filters, we, we know people are using these. Um, and they can come here, they can choose the colour, they could come here, they can choose the price. It's saving the user additional clicks, it's making things uh, much easier to find, it's lifting that information um, out of a, um, a previously hidden space. So we now have our baseline, we have our variant. We could look at making um, tests uh, and making changes to our, um, our filters panel as well. So if we find a data point that says that users are coming on here, maybe it's overwhelming, maybe we've talked to our users and they, they say, I just don't get it, it's overwhelming, a lot of information to take in. We could look at um, making variants for this design as well. You can put that into its own A-B test. So we've looked at a prototype and then the next thing we want to do We've created our hypothesis. We are now looking to test our hypothesis. So we have said we want to create an A-B test, looking to make popular filters more prominent with the um, with those pill pattern that we just said. And um, we want to now put this into the test. So we can't just put this out and just uh, put both variants live and you know just see what happens. We again, we need this to be structured. It's, it's, uh, this is a, a scientific process that will give us uh, guaranteed results. So we're gonna look at testing the hypothesis in an AB. So what we need to look at is, um, we need to look at statistical significance. So it's a lot of words, but it's important to understand. So statistical significance is the likelihood that a change that you see in your AB test is not down to random chance. So you could put something live um, and it could have a, a good impact on your on your metrics or it could have a bad impact on your metrics and it could be random. So what we wanna do is minimize that risk. We wanna make sure that we're not seeing random changes. So generally we work in uh, to a 95% statistical significance. This is quite an industry standard. I see some companies working to a 90% as well. So if you work for the 95%, that means there's a 5% chance that your uh, change in metrics is random. So we're really minimizing that risk. So we want that number to be nice and high. So the way that we achieve statistical significance is um, you need a certain amount of traffic. So if I come to um, here, so this is a, a sample size calculator. This one is on abtasty.com. And I just Googled a sample size calculator. And what this means is we need a certain amount of traffic to come in and see our variants to be able to be positive that it isn't down to random chance. So uh, let's say our, I'm gonna, it'll be quite high, let's say on Etsy, um, 5%, that, that's a very high number, but it's just for the ease of maths. Um, we're currently seeing, uh, we, we currently have a 5% conversion rate. If I just go back to this design, from this page, we, we see a 5% conversion rate of an, a user adding an item to their basket, that's what that's saying. And number of visitors, let's say we get um, 
10,000 visitors a week. That's quite a high amount of traffic. We're on Etsy, so uh, but we can look to um, we can we can say that's true. If we want to have the minimum detectable effect, so that we can be 95% positive that this is um, that this is having the impact that we want it to have, and it's not random, we need to see a 22% percentage uplift on our 5% which means we're going from five percentage points in conversion to 6.12 percentage points in conversion. Another, so what this is saying is we need 10,000 um, uh, hits, 10,000 sessions, um, which would be 5,000 per variant. We split that down the middle, 50-50. The, the baseline gets 5,000 in a week, for example. The other one gets 5,000 in a week. Um, if we want to see the minimum sector effect, we need to see that 6.12 in our variant to be able to say that we are 95% confident that this is having the impact we want it to have and it's not random. So that's if you have a certain amount of traffic, but the other way you could go around this is again, we have um, a 5% conversion rate um, and you can uh, make an informed decision. We think um, that you know we're gonna have a 25% impact on, uh, on our conversion rate based on this new variant. We want 95% statistical significance. So we need 4,900 uh, sessions per variant to be able to say yes we're 95% sure that the changes we're seeing are not random and they are um, they are scientifically backed and we've reached we've reached statistical significance so if we go back to our um, our process now we um, have understood data we've created an informed hypothesis out the back of that We've tested our hypothesis and we've reached a statistical significance. We're 95% sure that the numbers we're seeing when we're analyzing our results are not random. If we're seeing positive impact and we're seeing, yes, we've reached that minimum detectable effect, we can look to implement those changes. We've been really lean here. We've done this very quickly. We've built a very uh, quick and dirty A-B test. You can do that through products such as Optimizely um, and you can split your traffic half is seeing one variant, the other is seeing another variant, and we can look to implement that now in our real code base, put that in production, put that on our real website, and then from here, we look to understand the data again. We have new users seeing this new pattern, seeing what we've just built. We wanna see how they're interacting with it. And from that data, we can look to build a new hypothesis, and you can start going around and around again. Uh, this is an iterative process, so we're gonna keep moving and moving and moving. On the other hand, if we're analyzing our results, we've um, reached statistical significance and we're um, seeing that we didn't have the impact, maybe we, our conversion rate has actually lowered, we wanna iterate. Why has that happened? We need to create a new hypothesis. So maybe we need to talk to our users at this point. Maybe we need to do some usability testing, some user interviews. What is it about our new design that wasn't right? Maybe it's unclear. Maybe we weren't getting the right filters. Uh, and from here, we can look to create a new hypothesis and we can move into our test again. So you constantly move through cycles. There'll be more data points that come in. The more we test, the more we learn, the more we can improve the products and push our metrics. So I hope you found this useful. This was a really quick tour of experimentation and optimization. If you found it useful, please subscribe as it really helps the channel and I'll see you again soon.